now we're back I want to say this is what uh, quantum Bible 4 I don't really remember but I think it's 4 and we stopped right here at Kai Uk Estin and what I hadn't what I started to do but didn't quite finish was I had started with the guy named Martian who replaced the L2 when he died all right so what's important about this as I started to say before is that he's a Kai now just a mere Kai not a Kaiser but of course he's Emperor of Byzantium at the time that he's doing what he's doing all right he's really you know like important in the eyes of the people around him but not in the eyes of God that's part of what this is saying but it's it's more trenchant than that and this is what I want to get at when you're reading these things at the time if you knew to do the meter like I'm doing here at the time you read this you would get a lot more out of it because you'd be so familiar with the contemporary history you're going through okay so for us we have to go backwards in time and the thing that's phenomenal about doing that is that God has managed to preserve knowledge of the stuff going on at the time so that when you read it now many years hence you know what he meant then it's really I keep you know when I'm doing this I'm like wow I'm finding this I'm finding this I'm finding this and sometimes it's really obscure the information but yet it's quite trenchant and you'd need it for interpretation and we still need it for interpretation today and God not only preserved scripture but he preserved the means of interpreting it in light of the history in the past so what does this signify about the history that was going on then that a reader if he knew the meter would know then but yet we can still know now because remember this is all prophecy for the actual tribulation and in order to discern it and learn the lessons they will need it's going to have to be preserved for them too so what is this Kai Uk Estin this seems like a harmless meaningless phrase and is not well any theologian reading this will tell you well see the Roman Empire the revived Roman Empire that's supposed to exist during the tribulation is not now now meaning when okay and the historian or the theologian will say well there's no Ro revived Roman Empire now really do you even know what this phrase means but at the time that John was writing it's 88 AD when he writes of course this is about something in the future but the angel is saying to John is not now I mean right I'm, the word now isn't here and is not okay so the question is is with reference to what point in time not with reference to what point in time because the Roman Empire was very much alive at the time he's talking to John it's 88 AD Domitian is on the throne in Western Rome which at that time was the only Rome so what is this? Okay? Think about that. I gotta take off my sweater. It's getting warm again. Well, let's first talk about the context that we've been using because that's how this thing is managing to fit so well is that each one of these words which are our particles in Quantum Bible each one of these words has X number of syllables in this case one syllable ain meaning was alright and that's at the end of 451 or it's in 451 okay there's a sort of hedging there about when Theo died Did he died 450 or 451 okay and I don't know what fiscal John actually switches fiscals all the time in his writing so 451 it circa somewhere within a year of that all right Theo dies all right so now the new Kai haha is Martian who married Theo's sister Polkaria 
and they didn't have any sex and they were all self-righteous about that and both him and her actually okay so now we got to talk about well, what is Martian that Kai Uk Estin characterizes his reign because he ends up reigning until 457 and the end of this is 455 and there's a lot to say about Martian I didn't realize there was so much first and is not actually characterizes the meaning of his own reign how is that well when Martian came took over there was uh, there was a kind of a lot of problems that um, Byzantium was going through so one of the and is not that he started right away is he he made is not the tribute that they that the Byzantium uh, was paying to the Huns he stopped paying tribute so their tribute is not see this this wit the tribute is not he stopped paying tribute to them now the reason they, the Byzant Byzantine Empire was paying tribute to them was it was kinda like a mafioso thing if you don't pay us the Huns said we'll just invade you and sack you that's how weak Byzantium was at the time okay and he stopped tribute he just stopped it and that wasn't particularly popular amongst the people who were likely to be sacked. All right. But and is not, he also stopped, see, and is not, he also stopped a lot of the taxes that were on the wealthy. Now, it just so happened for him, this was a felicitous thing because Attila, who was the head of the Huns, got kind of involved with the West. And Martian didn't help. See, this is Valentinian III was on the throne at the time. Valentinian III was beleaguered by the Huns. All right, and Martian didn't try to help his brother ruler, as it were. It wasn't his physical brother in the West. Didn't help him. So he laid. So basically, what he said was, "We're not paying you tribute anymore, but we're not going to do anything if you try to get your money from the West." So the Huns went to the West to try to get money. And they were successful at it. Because Valentinian III was a young guy under advisors too. Okay. And this is, you know, the last four years before he dies. And the reason he dies is that he's um, assassinated by one of his advisors. Because he had ordered the assassination of another advisor. And he was trying to, you know, be an adult. And that was why he ends up dying. And Martian didn't do anything about it. So, and is not. He is not doing anything to reward the Huns anymore. He is not doing anything to help his Western Empire relative anymore. He's not really related, but through Polkaria he would be. Vaguely. Okay? He also is not of the class. He's not of the class of the elites. Okay? He is a sort of a social outsider. Alright? Who, because of his abilities, Polkaria picked him. And because he wouldn't have sex with her, he agreed not to have sex with her, she picked him. So he is not a member of society by, you know, previous means. He's on the outs. He's on the outside, not on the inside. So you can sort of understand, okay, well, he's ingratiating himself then by n reducing taxes, vastly reducing taxes. He didn't, he, he also was not going to continue a lot of the wasteful practices that the Byzantine Empire had been doing. In other words, is not means a turn in direction. He is not going in the same direction as the Byzantine Empire had. And one of the biggest changes, again, was that he is not subscribing to a universal Roman Empire with the West. He broke with it. Well, what that did is that ended up saving him a hell of a lot of money. Okay, so the money that he lost by, you know, making tax breaks, really big tax breaks on the wealthy. Um, and the, and the, ref the sort of way that he reformed the operation of the government 
and a bunch of other things that he did. He did a lot of financial and legal reforms that were very helpful. So he's, the government saved a ton of money, plus they were saving a ton of money because they weren't paying the Huns anymore. What ends up happening is that, that the government solidifies and becomes more efficient and becomes more, um, a little more virtuous under Martian. Well, that endears him then to everybody. Okay, it was primarily the rich, and he's an outsider versus the rich, so that made them think better of him too. All right, but what you have going on here is a real break from prior Byzantine government practices, taxation practices, um, what do you want to call it, bribing practices. Because one of the things he, he also tried to end, he didn't succeed in it completely, but to some extent, was that then as now, I don't know how aware you are of this, but government offices were purchased. That was always true in the Roman Empire. Okay, you were supposed to be appointed based on your merit, and Augustus tried to do some of that. But basically what, ha what had happened most of the time for many offices is that you, were, you purchased it. You paid money to the government, and then you got an office, and that would give you the right to rape whatever uh, people were under your office for whatever government job you had so long as that you kept the peace. That's always been true and it's still true today. I mean it's really marked and obvious under Trump. That's how Russia operates. That's how a lot of the world operates. And they're more surreptitious about it today. But that's pretty much how government operates is that you get your position in a government post based on you know some kind of quid pro quo. And then you're free to make money on it or do whatever benefits you on it out of the post that you have afterwards. Now, how does that work? Well, in the U.S., what it does is it means you establish connections with various corporations and whatever. And then you make sure that the laws that you make benefit them. That was going on under the Democrats, too. It goes on under either party. It's just the Democrats are smoother about it so you don't know as much. That's, the government has been that way. I'm not saying it's good, it's bad. But Martian actually tried, and of course since he, he's claiming a sort of holiness with his wife, he actually tried to reform and it had some success at reforming government. So now it's not strictly you buy your government office. Now you have to actually have to do something good for the people that you're supposed to serve. Now it wasn't a lot, but it was some. Okay. The other ook asked in about him was that, especially after his wife died, he backed off of, you know, the our form of religion is the only form of religion, and if you have another form of religion, you're a heretic and we confiscate your property, la, la, la. He backed off a lot of that. Okay, so he is not the raving lunatic that his wife was, but, you know, mostly after she died. I mean, she modified a little bit as she got older. But she was a raving lunatic about, you know, her version of Christianity and you had to adhere to it. That's what this thing was all about, Council of Chalcedon. Alright? So he backs off that. Um, the other thing that is not, basically, the most important thing, is that he is not, um, what do you want to call it? He's viewing the Byzantine Empire as a secular thing. In other words, as, a, as something that you, you're supposed to take good care of. Alright? You take good care of it because it's a government for a people. I, I You know, old-fashioned notion, right? But that's a sort of virtue that was pretty largely absent and is still absent today in Russia. That was absent in the Byzantine Empire. They were appointed by God and they could do whatever they wanted. They were absolute rulers. Martian didn't really approach the position of being an emperor that way. Now what that does then is that introduces the idea, which we consider as modern today, that government is, is an entity that is there to exist to serve the people, not something that you do because, oh, you're number one top dog and you can do whatever you want. 
the old school of your top dog and you do whatever you want is something Marshall was dispensing with and what Donald Trump is attempting to revive. Everything about Trump is I'm on top and you have to do whatever I want. That's the way Byzantine government was run, pretty much. So everybody was trying to curry favor with the top dogs so that they could get what they wanted and then they could lord it over. Which is totally anti-Christian, of course. Alright? So, is not means a significant departure from the past. It doesn't just mean that all oh, this future beast that was does not exist now. Well, yeah, it doesn't exist now, especially trenchant meaning, because Martian was changing it. All right? Now, this was and is not also applies to the West. And and is not also applies to Valentinian III. Valentinian III was a young kid. He was under Gallia Placida, his mother, and he was under his advisors, and they were always fighting with each other. And he, you know, chafed under it. He wanted to be his own man. And during this time, he tries to be his own man, so and is not means he is not going to give in to his mother, his advisors, la di la. So this marks the four year struggle and. Kai Uk Estin, four year struggle of him trying to be his own guy. I am not. I will not. I do not. That's what he was trying to do. I do not want to be like what you say. I do not want to be under your control. I want to be my own person. And that really characterizes his life during these four years. Now, that characterization. And you have to understand how emperorship worked. It was distant from the people. It was turned into this sort of mystical, high-value, quasi-god-like status, which you know had long been one of the myths about the Roman Empire that everybody subscribed to and laughed at. Okay, so to see the to, so to see your own emperor to the extent uh, very few people knew about this but they were influential to see your own emperor fighting against his own advisors will give you the non-emperor courtier or the non-emperor somebody related close enough to the court that you know this stuff will give you the same urge because if some rich person is doing it you want to do it too so there is a there is a you know, in the higher circles who knew about this, they would talk to their wives, to their kids, and their servants would hear it, and then the servants would talk, and it would trickle down through the empire. And it's like, wow, maybe it's okay to rebel against these elites at the top. So in the East, you got Martian doing it as an institutional thing in the name of virtue and economy, and he was really good at it. But in the West, you also got Valentinian doing it, and he's the emperor. And while you're hoi polloi in the streets buying, getting, you know, buying their whatever they got, wouldn't necessarily know about it. There'd be pss, 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 going on. So it would be gossip, but it was an idea. So the idea of rebelling against the elites. Now during the same time, and is not, the Western Empire is not free from the Vandals, the Huns, the Ostrogoths. This is when Attila is busy attacking the West. And actually in 455 when Valentinian dies, and I think it's just after he died that this happened, it might have been before, Attila sacked Rome again. So now you've got further, see, Valentinian is against his advisors. That had been going on for a long time. Attila sacks Rome. Well, with all the pss -pss 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 going against the elites, well... You know, look, the Huns aren't going to attack us. They'll just attack the rich and sack them. Let's help the Huns open the door and sack Rome. You see, rebellion. Key for force. Rebellion. 
So you got a guy institutionally trying to reform from within on the east, eastern Rome, but in western Rome, from the emperor on down, you got rebellion percolating, and so of course it would be easy for Attila and his Huns to to sack Rome. But see, no, whenever you see something like one group comes in and attacks and wins over another group, don't ever assume that it's just the strength of the group attacking. There's always somebody within who's helping. And that's going on here. So Kai Ukestin, and there is not. There's not coalescence. There's not agreement. There is not harmony. Okay? Amongst the rulers. Amongst the elites. And there's not harmony in the people, therefore, either. And therefore, there is. See, what is not is peace. So what is is rebellion. So see how trenchant? It's just four words. Kai, who guessed it? And okay, the Kai, well, see, he's Kai now. Martian is newly Kai. But Valentinian was already Kaiser. Not. Yeah, by the end of word four, Valentinian is not. He was a Kaiser at the beginning, but he's not at the end, because he dies at the end of this. You see how clever this is? Now, doesn't that give you a whole lot more meaning about the future because of how it's associated with the past? Okay? Because what this is painting, and it's going to get into more detail about this later, is that the beast was, is not, and is about to go into destruction, which I'll cover in the next increment. But that's also the future of the beast. The beast wasn't, oh yeah, he's on stage for a little while, and then he's not. And he's going to come back and then go down to destruction again. In other words, this massive empire of the past is not and already went to destruction. But the people are going to want to resurrect it. And it'll have the same result. So one day it's going to be a was and is not and went or will go into destruction. Mankind never learns the lessons from the past, which is why it's so important to know that this is a timeline tagging the past. So that if you're reading this just for the doctrine of it, it's like, okay, there's going to be all this huff and puff like we got in the U.S. now about what we're doing today and how great we are and yada, 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 and everybody in the news and all the pundits and every, all the politicians are all blah, 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 but it's not going to last. It too was, like yesterday, okay, and is not by the end of today, and will go into destruction by the end of today. So obviously the point is, why do you waste your time on those things? Don't worry about the beast to come. See, this is the thing that the the, the trap for people who drool over prophecy. Oh, who's the beast? Who's the beast? Is it this seven nation confederacy in Europe? And who are the ten horns? And blue, 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 blue. Honey, the biggest point to know about the, the seven heads and the ten horns is that they ain't going to last. Whatever they are, they're going to be. You'll be here or not. Likely not. And they're going to be a new beast, and it's going to have a time when it becomes a was, and it will not be, and it's going into destruction. So what the bleep do you care? And of course, somebody's going to say, well, then why is God telling us about it if it's so unimportant? Because here's what's important about this kind of stuff. People get all psychologically fixated on it. So this is here to warn you not to be fixated. Remember I did that video on Dr. Theodore's book about the myth of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? People are all fixated on the Roman Empire. 
and they're still fixated and that's why this beast is even going to occur again to revive Rome and this in particular is the last set, last part of the anaphoric center and it's basically telling you the same thing everybody's fixated on the Roman Empire oh I'm an emperor oh I'm a power oh I'm doing this <coughs> Oh, I'm doing that. Until tomorrow. Then you're was. You're is now. But ook is coming. Not. Ook means the factual not. It is not. Doesn't exist. So why are you all drooling over the reviving of the Roman Empire then? Okay. Now the Roman Empire still existed at this point. It's divided in two. But this, many historians, Roman historians will tell you, 455, Caiucestin, was the end of the Roman Empire in the West. The effective end of it. The last guy who could sort of hold up the popular attitude together was Valentinian III and he rebelled against his advisors so now rebelling against plus the sacking of Rome in 455 either just before or just after he dies is all the rage now so Rome is not in the West Rome is not you see how trenchant this is see how many history how many lessons you can learn from the past and then when you go to look out at your current life and you're hearing all this blah, 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 blah going on in the news, it's like, wait a minute, this is soon going to be is not. So why don't I try to spend my time on what is? Okay, now guess real hard. What's a better way to spend your time? You're doing the dishes. Soon it is not going to be a thing you have to do anymore. But while you are doing it is, can't you think about Bible doctrine? And then when the ook of the dishes comes, it's no longer an action you need to do. You still have the is of Bible, and you had it all during the time you did the dishes, which is not. It, it helps you orient to like your life to know this past. It helps you orient your life now, and that's why it's important that it be in the Bible. Oh, who are the seven horns? Oh, who are the ten heads? 16,222 videos on YouTube are busy trying to speculate who they will be. But they will be not. They will be was. They are about to go to destruction. So what the f*** do you care? And then, well, what is? Well, God is. How about learning Him? That's an interesting idea. Because isn't most of your life boring anyway? How can God be boring? And is He boring when He's sitting here spending time with such wit? Look at the trouble He went to. He preserved these four words. And then He preserved the information about Martian and Valentinian III and pokery and all this stuff so that I could say what those four words mean and you didn't need me to be able to say them but I wouldn't be able to say them if he didn't preserve this information and he preserved this information though billions upon billions of people never learn it Now, what does that tell you about God? Remember I said, well, okay, forget about the seven heads and the ten horns. How about what is? Well, how about learning God? Well, what does that tell you about Him? The trouble that He was willing to go to to make sure all these words were preserved in the original so aptly that they actually fit real history. And then he preserved our knowledge of that history so we could know the precise fit of these words. What does it tell you about him? And 
not to put too fine a point on it, but Kai instead of Kaiser, that's pretty biting. Those are God's words. That's God's opinion, isn't it? So now you're learning about him. And what are you learning? Oh, a Kaiser is just a Kai. Now you can just stop there and say, oh, well, see, he's deprecating the rich. He's deprecating those in power. Ha, ha, ha. Or you can say, oh, how rude. He's deprecating the people who are in power and they have such crappy lives. You know, because nobody has a worse life than a ruler. And then that makes you want to think negatively of God. But then now look at yourself. If you're a ruler, and this is in James, you just threw that at my mind. Which, where, where was that in James? James 3. Oh, rulers. Maybe it's not James 3. It might be in James 2. Oh, rulers, glorify, glor or James 1, actually. Oh, rulers, glorify in your humiliation. Oh, poor, glorify in your wealth. In other words, you're not a Kaiser, maybe. If you are, glorifying the fact that that's not what makes you important to God. Glorifying the fact that if you're not a Kaiser and you're just a nobody in society, that it doesn't matter to God that you're a nobody. You don't have to be a somebody by society standards. And if you are a somebody by society standards, that's not what makes you important to God. And you're surely important to God because here's Cayuque Eston preserved with the history of the people it references so you can know. Then you're important to God that he would preserve all that just so you can know him. Think about it. 